Good morning. That's on page 1000 of our church Bibles, and it's after the book of Titus. Greetings. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, a brother, to Philemon, a beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, a sister, and Archippus, a fellow, a fellow soldier and church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Verse 8. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, Yet, for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he, indeed, he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. 13. I would have been glad to keep him with me, in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you may have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your own me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, Prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. 22, 23. Ephras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends his greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And well done with all those names, Demona. <laughs> uh, now, turn back to Colossians. There's a reason why we read Philemon this morning. Uh, because Philemon is the letter that went with Colossians to the town of Colossae uh, when Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians. We're on page 984, page 984, and this is the passage we're going to read today. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Heavenly Father, as we come to these words, we pray that you will open up your word to our hearts and help us to understand these great truths today and apply them to our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. I don't know whether when you go on holiday you go to gift shops and uh, look at the comedy plaques that are up for sale, you know, or the tea towels. Um, here's one of my favourites. Uh, it says, rules of the house. If it's dirty, wash it. If it rings, answer it. If you spill it, wipe it. If you open it, close it. If it runs out, replace it. If it's borrowed, return it. Very important rule here. If you sleep on it, make it. <laughs> if you move it, put it back. If you turn it on, turn it off. If it needs doing, 
do it. <laughs> There's a sense of desperation in that last command, isn't there? Isn't that good, common sense, helpful, everyday advice? Maybe you've got a list of instructions in, on your kitchen fridge. I don't know, something like that. Well, the, these are what we call household lists or, or household tables. And the Bible's full of them. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, the Ten Commandments, what we call the, the Decalogue, um, they are God's list of commandments for us, aren't they? They are instructions for daily living. Uh, but you've also got several New Testament letters. Uh, Ephesians is one of them. 1 Peter is another. Um, and, and Colossians here is another, where we have have a household table of commands and they're very important so we're going to focus on the the rules for Christian households here uh, in chapter 3 but they're not just a sort of cut and paste list Paul wasn't writing his letter and dealing with these great doctrines and then said hey do you know at this point we ought to have a little list of do's and don'ts this list flows out of the great truths of the letter Paul has this uh, immense gospel that he presents to us in Colossians. Let's just remind ourselves with a bit of an overview as we've been out of Colossians for a couple of weeks. Let's just remind ourselves of the truths of this letter and how they need to connect with our lives. He has told us that Jesus Christ is Lord. Typically, he doesn't call him Jesus. He calls him Christ. He calls him the, the Son of God. He calls him um, the one who is before all things and in whom all things hold together. He also calls him this big title, The Beginning. It's an interesting title for Jesus, isn't it? He is the beginning in the sense that you know, the world has gone wrong and he's the beginning of putting it right. By his death and resurrection, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his Son, whom he loves. Jesus is our Redeemer. In him we have the forgiveness of sins. And so the great reconciliation that was worked out at the cross that we'll be remembering when we come to the Lord's Supper, that great reconciliation has to be worked out in our lives, has to be worked out in the daily details of our lives. And so there's a mystery at the heart of Colossians, and we came to it at the end of chapter 1. The mystery at the heart of the Christian faith is this, and it's now been revealed. This is what it's all about. This is what our Christian lives are about. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what Christianity is ultimately about. We are united to Christ. He lives in us by his spirit. He transforms us. He brings us to life. Uh, and that means that also he is Lord of our lives. And we have to live for him. So as we receive Christ Jesus as Lord, says Paul, continue walking in him. And the whole of life is a, a life of walking in Christ, drawing our strength from him to change our lives. And that change, as we saw in, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, means turning our back on our old way of life, um, and putting off the life of sin and putting on the new life of Christ, turning our back on dead religion that is only taken up with the, the physical elements of the world, the externals, the things we can see and touch and smell, and, and actually focusing on our hearts, on the inner spiritual life of change that comes from Christ living in us. And that's a, a radical new life, isn't it? I've been using that word radical in my sermon titles for several weeks. Um, radical change, radical virtue, and radical worship, and now radical relationships. Because if we put this gospel to work, if these great truths shape our lives, it will show in a radical change in our lives. Never buy into the idea that Christianity is just something we do in church. And it's irrelevant to what we do out in the street. It's irrelevant to how we are at home. The gospel we believe is the gospel that shapes our lives. So, let's come to this list and see how the gospel is to be worked out in three situations. Marriage, first of all, and then family and parenthood. And then finally, and more controversially, uh, slavery in the first century and, and work for us today. Let's come to marriage first of all. G uh, Paul says here in verse 18, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. 
Now, marriages are different in every culture. Every culture has different expectations. Some cultures are driven by strong matriarchal women. Others are driven by strong patriarchal men, a domineering man who thinks he can always get his own way. Um, I don't know. I'd be interested to know, those of you who've come from other cultures, how you find marriage in Britain and Brit the British culture of marriage. What, please tell us over coffee what you notice that's different about, about the British culture of marriage. Um, all of us, whatever culture we've come from, we learn from previous generations, don't we? We look at our parents. We look at our grandparents. Now, that may have been dreadful. <laughs> it may be that you came from a, from a couple who weren't even married and, and they weren't faithful to each other and they didn't stick together. Or it may be that you came um, from a, a couple who were married for 50 years, you know, and, and, and utterly faithful to each other. But I want to say this. We, we don't have an understanding of marriage that is just built on our parents. Our understanding of Christian marriage is based on a greater relationship. What does Paul say here? Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. The Lord Jesus submitted in his mission to the Father. He submitted to everything that his Father asked of him, even to death on a cross. Now, Paul makes it very clear in, in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, and verse 3. Uh, it's, it's not an easy passage to interpret, the passage that relates to head coverings and worship and so on. But the principle that's stated at the start is very clear. Paul states that men and women have different roles to play out in, in marriage. And it's not easy to you know, follow on from that, but the principle is very clear. He says... I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Just as Christ submitted to the Father, so the wife must submit to her husband. The husband has a role to lead, to be the initiator, to be the calm head that leads the way. Uh, I know that flies in the face of everything that our current feminist culture, strongly feminist culture, says, and, and there'll be an outcry when some people hear me uh, say what Paul says there. But I want to say I think we neglect these roles at our peril. We are losing something precious, and we're turning our backs on something even bigger, which is the example of Jesus. If we say you don't need to be submitted in marriage, then we're saying Jesus was wrong to submit himself to his father. What does that submission look like in, in practice? Well, I think all the, all the decision-making pr uh, processes of marriage are in negotiation, aren't they? Um, yet there still has to be this respect for the dynamic of leadership and submission. It's very significant here. Paul does not say, wives, obey your husbands. He does say, children, obey your parents. He has a verb, to obey, and he uses that for children. He does not say that wives are, are to obey their husbands. That's something we get from the Book of Common Prayer, uh, the traditional English marriage service. Um, but it's not actually the verb that Paul uses here. There's a difference between submission and obedience. For a wife, it's a matter of being married to a man that she can joyfully submit to that she respects, she trusts him, she loves him. And part of the joy of marriage is submitting to a, a good man, isn't it? If that marriage changes over time into, with, with a husband who turns into a, an unloving, selfish ego who abuses you, you're not called to follow him into evil. You're not called to submit to evil. You're not called to hide his cruelty. You're not called to submit to violence. Yes, we are to practice forgiveness. We are to work for change and reconciliation. But submission doesn't mean that your husband has a right to be a tyrant. And that's because verse 19 is just as important as verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Do not embitter them is another translation of that, that word. Do not be harsh with them. 
Do not be behave in a way that closes out and embitters and alienates your wife. Because your role as a husband is to lead, not to exploit, not to use your position to your own advantage, not to be a slob, not to be selfish. Rather, let your leadership be modeled on that of Christ for his church. And the verb to love here is, is agape, it's self sacrificial love and that's what Paul says isn't it in the parallel passage that we always read at weddings in Ephesians 5 um, Christ gave himself up for his church to make her holy and perfect and a husband should love his wife in that same self-giving way Christian love is not self-seeking Christian love is not about my satisfaction Christian love is agape love that finds its fulfillment in serving the other, to be tender to the one that we're married to, not to be harsh or to be abusive. And if you are being abused, don't suffer on your own. Go and get pastoral help. Talk about it. Seek help. Notice in the next sentence that when Paul talks to children, he, he likewise balances it. When he comes to tell children to obey, he also speaks to fathers. And it's interesting, isn't it, he speaks to fathers rather than mothers. Um, verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. I'm speaking to an audience of adults, all right? So I don't know <laughs> how you want me to apply this passage at this point. Uh, but let's, we're talking about it in theory, aren't we, in present company. A child living at home, even as a teenager... Um, some children live at home in up to the age of 35, don't they, these days, because they can't afford to get into the housing market. But I would suggest that they are adults by that stage. Um, children who are living at home and dependent on their parents are required to obey them. And there is so much pressure today, isn't there, to erode that. You know, th th there is a sense in which we have so overemphasized uh, the child that we almost sort of separate the child from their parents and the parents are be to be distrusted and everything is done to undermine the parents authority to talk about the self-fulfillment of the child as though their parents don't exist no the purpose of childhood is to be shaped by the authority of your parents to be parented if you like and we mustn't undermine that and that means that fathers and, and mothers as well must not provoke their children into being rebels and continually discouraging them. Now, very, very important point here um, to learn in parenting is that you need to teach your children both law and grace. The problem is that some parents can be law parents and some parents can be grace parents and not get the two together. Um, children need to know boundaries. They want to tread those boundaries and see if you care about the boundaries. And you do need to have some law at the boundaries, don't you? And some punishment when they disobey and when they rebel. But they also need the loving encouragement of grace that makes room for forgiveness, that respects them as people, uh, and that cherishes the bond between parent and child. A child who doesn't trust their parents. And I, as a pastor, I've known situations where that is the case where maybe uh, you know, a parent that's failing, has got all sorts of social problems, is, is loving one child and absolutely hating the other and abusing them emotionally. Um, it's a long time ago I had to be involved in a case like that. But to see the effect that had on, on the, the child in that case was, was heartbreaking. Children need three times as much encouragement as they need punishment, don't they? And love needs to be a stronger, or grace needs to be a stronger motivation than law can ever be. Imagine going on holiday to a campsite, and there's a boundary fence around the campsite. <clears throat> and there's a gate, and, and the first thing you say as parents is, you do not go outside the gate. That's the first thing you say, right? What's the children want to do? They want to go up to the fence and they want to put their fingers in the wire and shake the fence to see if it comes down. And they're thinking about what it is outside the fence that their parents don't want them to have, aren't they, immediately. Whereas if you say, look, this campsite's brilliant, let's go and play table tennis, let's go and play tennis, let's go swimming or whatever. 
you know, that's the positive incentive, isn't it? They won't worry about what's outside the boundary if you're sharing life with them. And they'll ignore the fact that the reason why that fence is there is to stop them from being abducted because you're away on holiday. And that the parents are concerned for their children while they're away. We need to get law and grace together in family life. Now, I've gone through those fairly uh, rapidly because I want to spend some time on the final part of this passage. Let's come to the elephant in the room. Paul talks about marriage, he talks about family, and he talks about slavery. Yet I would say, actually, I think he's talking about work as well as as slavery, and we can apply it in a 21st century sense to our working lives. Some people say, well, look at Paul, he's he's affirming slavery. Um, How can we believe anything of what Paul says here because he affirms slavery? Uh, by giving rules to slaves and telling them to obey their earthly masters. Uh, And so they write off the whole section, and they say, it's out of date, that was Paul in his culture, forget it, it has nothing to say to us. And it would be anathema to us, and rightly so, if the Bible tolerated slavery. But let's spread our thoughts a bit wider here. God created marriage. God created the family life that flows from it. Those are what we call creation ordinances. They are good gifts ordained by God to be lived out according to the pattern that God intended. Marriage is God's invention. Sexuality is God's invention. Um, Having children is is God's blessing. Uh, it, it, It is something that God intended and designed. God also gave work. Work was there in the original creation order. And we may come and look at um, Genesis in in, in the coming months. I'm I'm pondering whether to to make that the the next series. Um, God created Adam and Eve, and he placed them in the garden to work the ground. He gave them work to do, to have authority over the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, and so on. So work was part of God's creation ordinance. And so was rest. The first six days God worked in creation, and the seventh day he rested. So work and rest are creation ordinances. We were made to work, and we need to rest. We also need to worship, to worship God. We were given the task of ruling God's creation. You never find slavery in God's creation order. Slavery happens without explanation, just as sin happens without explanation as to where it came from. Slavery was never invented by God. And when I say slavery, I I mean the state of belonging to someone else, being held captive by them, having to work for them without any choice, and usually without any pay. All of the empires of the ancient world were built on slavery. Uh, Slavery is the result of sin, Uh, It is a result of the powerful exploiting the powerless. So how does God's word deal with slavery? Well, when we come to um, the Exodus, the people of Israel are redeemed from slavery. It's the great theme of redemption in the Old Testament. Um, And when we come to the law of Moses, uh, the law of Moses is written for sinners. And it deals with lots of different situations. So, for example, it deals with adultery in marriage, and it provides for divorce. Divorce was never part of the creation order. Um, It deals with involuntary manslaughter. Uh, There are going to be accidents, and people are going to be killed, and therefore it provided the cities of refuge. Um, And it also put limits on slavery. The fact that they were redeemed from slavery was written into Israel's DNA in all the ways that they dealt with the the foreigner and the alien and the way that they dealt with the slave. Every seventh year, all slaves were to get their freedom. And in the New Testament, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says in chapter 7, verses 21 and 22, Were you a slave when called? Were you a slave when Jesus called you to faith? Do not be concerned about it. I guess that can sound complacent to us when we think of 18th and 19th century slavery. But first century slavery was a little different. There were rights in law that uh, limited it and so on. 
Do not be concerned about it, he says, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Take it. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. And he then adds that no Christian should ever sell themselves into slavery. They, people sold themselves into slavery when they went bankrupt. And so it was, if you like, a bankruptcy proceeding that you sell yourself to someone and the money that they pay to buy you pays off your, pays off your debts. No Christian should ever sell themselves into slavery, he says, because you were bought with a price, the price of Christ's death, and you are precious to him. And then in 1 Timothy 1, which actually Helen and I were reading as our Bible reading this morning, um, Paul gives us a long list of sinners, and he defines their sins. And one of the sins he defines is the sin of slave trading, or enslavers, or people traffickers. In other words, Paul is saying you cannot be a Christian in the New Testament first century world and trade in slaves. It's not permitted. It is sinful. Now, before we come to his words here, let me explain why I got Demola to read uh, Philemon. It is because, as I've already hinted, the letter to the Colossians went to Colossae with another letter to Philemon, and both of those letters got there by the hands of Onesimus. Look at chapter 4 and verse 7. He says, Tychicus will tell you about all my activities. He's carrying the letter. I have sent him, verse 8, to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. Now, Onesimus had been a slave. There would have been lots of slaves in Colossae, uh, a, a town at the heart of the empire. But somehow, Onesimus has escaped. He's taken some of his master's money, maybe, and used that to get on board a ship in Ephesus and sail all the way to Rome. And we can't be sure, but it does seem to be that having got to Rome, he has found his way to other Christians, and those Christians have led him to Paul, and he's become a Christian himself. And he's become very useful to Paul. And Paul says he's a faithful and beloved brother, and he is one of you. And Paul sends him back to Colossae, and he says to Philemon, Receive him as a brother. Receive him as you would receive me. You see, the gospel has made that happen. That's the radical nature of the gospel. The gospel has turned Onesimus from a despised slave into a brother that they must receive. This, is, this story of these two letters together are telling us this radical idea that when a slave and their master both become Christians, they are equal in Christ, just as men and women are, just as husbands and wives are equal in Christ. And so the gospel of Jesus laid the axe at the root of the tree of slavery. We cannot discriminate against each other if we are in Christ. Today, last year, in Britain, 10,000 people were trafficked into Britain as slaves. Half of them were children. It's a staggering statistic, isn't it? If you're on a train and you see a big burly man and he's got a young woman sat next to him pushed up against the wall he's probably taking her somewhere and there is a brothel at the end of the line or something that she has been taken to against her will it goes on it is offensive and we should do everything we can to help such people gain their freedom so how do we read Paul's instructions here then what Paul here says to slaves, I think, applies to us today as employees. What is our attitude to work? In Paul's time, you were either a, a bondservant with some rights, you were a bondservant for a set period of time, or you were a slave with, with few, if any, rights. Um, but work is work, and we are where we are, and we must approach it with a Christian work ethic. So he says, verse 22, bondservants or slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters because they are your earthly masters. They are only your master here on earth. Their power is limited. They serve under God, 
and it's your duty as a Christian to obey them. But don't just obey them when they're watching, by way of eye service, 11, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. In your work, who sees what you do? And I'm looking at lots of people who work from home now, aren't I, as well? So, you know, those of us who work from home, who sees what we do? It's, it's the sort of the new normal, isn't it? Uh, it's a rather strange experience. Um, what do other people not know about your working life? What about the corners of our work where nobody ever goes? What about the things that nobody ever sees? I remember when my father was very old, he'd reached 90 and I became power of attorney for his finances and I sat in at his desk at home and I opened his drawers, uh, the filing cabinet, and everything was filed perfectly. <laughs> and it was only when, I was n when he was 90 that I realized that. He had a brilliant filing system going back to you know, things that he'd kept in the right file from the 1950s when their rateable value was changed or something. You know, he, Dad kept documents and he kept them cleanly. Nobody knew that until he came near to the end of his life. And finally, when he died, we cleared out his things. He did those things knowing that nobody else would know except his children when they came to clear out the house. We do those little things for God's glory, don't we? As an act of worship, to be organized, to be tidy, to be efficient. And verse 23 wraps, it up, it wraps everything up in it, actually, when it says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And in first century terms... If a slave master was cruel and unjust and exploited you, do you allow it to eat you up with hatred? Remember that justice doesn't ultimately belong to you. Verse 25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done and there is no partiality. God will bring that person into judgment. Now, contemporary issue. Does that mean that no Christian should ever go on strike? No, you have a legal right to withdraw your labor in a free society, but be careful. Remember that lots of people don't have that opportunity because they are employed by themselves. They are self-employed, and they don't make a fortune by doing that. So going on strike should be driven by a major injustice, shouldn't it? And that's why Paul then adds in verse 1 of chapter 4, masters treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. If you're a manager, how do you manage your staff? Do you listen to lies? Do you expect three people to do the work of five? Do you put yourself in the position of those who are working for you? What would you do in their situation? Do you do your job knowing that one day you will have to answer to God for the way that you have done it. So when God created us, he created us in his image. He made every one of us. He created us to re relate to each other in marriage, in family life, in working life. Sin has distorted and depraved every one of us, but there is redemption in Christ. And all our human relationships can be transformed by the grace of God in Christ. That is the radical nature of the gospel, and it changes every part of our lives for his glory. Let's sing together as we come to the Lord's Supper.